Hey everyone, how's it going? It is Wednesday again. Uh, sorry I got the mic right here. I know it's it's the most professional thing I can think of is put the mic as close to your face as possible. But unfortunately, Brian did not uh, was unable to make it this evening. So I'm going to be hosting this one solo. If you don't know me yet, my name is Matt. I'm the manager of the Northern Angler here. We're a small independent shop in Traverse City, Michigan, and we do fun stuff like live fly tying every Wednesday in the winter, especially during COVID months. So I'm excited tonight to have a friend of ours, uh, Tommy Green here, who's going to be tying us some big tubes for pike. Now, Tommy and I met a few years back. Uh, we started fishing, and mm -hmm. I think we kind of – we shared a, a – a, a lot of affection for uh, fly versus jerk, which mm -hmm. is if you don't know fly versus jerk, you <laughs> probably, <ready. laughs> yes, strap in. It's the ultimate like uh, quarantine lockdown YouTube show if yes. you're a pike angler at all. Um, yes. Or if you're not, I mean, it's such a fun yeah. show on YouTube and that's not all we'll talk about tonight. I, don't worry, but we, we both kind of <laughs> really enjoy it in our, I think it helped our, our fishing a lot and our tying because some of the the anglers on there are just i mean they're light years of yeah. ahead of what we were doing in the u.s here so yeah um tommy real quick tell us tell us about yourself i guess huh i mean <laughs> yeah so i obviously fish a lot um i really like pike probably almost more than anything else and i really got into the two ply stuff like matt was saying especially watching a lot of the um, the Connell Gratis or the fly versus jerk stuff. Um, if you a lot of the stuff that I'm doing tonight is adapted from Nicholas Bauer. If if you haven't heard of him, you should look him up on YouTube. It's amazing. His earlier stuff. I was looking at it earlier today. It was like 2010, yeah. and the the first videos I watched of pike tube flies. It's all in Swedish. Yeah, we had to can't understand to anything. Watch the captions mm -hmm. and then trying to adapt because back then even what you know trying to adapt materials that we could source in town or cutting up latex gloves for wiggle right. tails or just <laughs> weird stuff that didn't work. Um, but yeah, I started doing a lot of that and um this is kind of a i don't know kind of a morphed adaption to what he does really well i feel like so. we've had enough time to refine it yeah. for our fishery i think yeah i know i tried a lot of the stuff he was doing right off the bat in northern michigan waters <laughs> and it was probably a little excessive yeah some um, of the some of the, the bigger like 14 inch flash flies were pretty sizable for what we have going here yeah. not salt water no. not salt water pike by any means um but yeah so a lot of the stuff that i've done it's it's based off of that um i'd say overall i've where i've kind of gotten them to they're a little bit shorter than what the, the fly length themselves they're a little bit shorter than a lot of the stuff he ties although some of the stuff he's tied more recently um, I think it's a little bit more versatile, so he'll like run different size tails and, and rigs within them. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the fly tonight is really a, a lighter weight um, version of one of these flies. Some of, the, some of the heavier ones have a little bit more material um, on the head or they'll have like multiple layers of deer hair, and this is only two. And this one's a little bit more castable on an eight weight. 
Um, I mainly fish a 10 weight just for ease of casting, but I've also fished these a lot on eight weights. Um, and it's a super versatile fly. You can fish it deep, you can fish it shallow based on the lines that you're using. Um, I think as we're tying the fly, the longest part of the fly is just all of the layers of glue um, that go into it. And I think as that's drying throughout the tying part, uh, we can talk more about the rigging and the whole system. Um, and before we get too far in tonight, um, we're you'll notice that Tommy's using a little bit different format fly than a lot of people will use. Uh, um, and again, this is adapted again. Uh, but also, I mean, it's such a cool platform to use because you can have how many flies with you and buy one pack of hooks for the whole season has oh, always yeah. been it's, such a do you such want a, to look at some of the sure oh yeah yeah so basically tying one fly um you can fish i mean multiple different things so the where's the best view for this uh, pretend it's a fly right in front of you there how about that All right. They can so see picture here's picture. here's one of the hook rigs. This is what I would typically run inside of this, um, and it's great because when you catch a fish, you can slide this up. It's out of the way to unhook. Um, if something goes wrong with the hook or the hook bends out, you can just swap in a new one. Um, when you're fishing it, you can completely change the size of the fly by taking the tail off and putting on a much bigger one. Okay, here's another some other ones here. So you can see the, the size difference between, <laughs> between these two tails. So you can drastically change the size of the fly. So if you imagine that this here is on the back of that, and then you put this on the back of that, and then you can change colors. I mean, pretty much anything you're doing, um, if you're needing to fish deep suddenly or you're wanting to fish shallow, it's really versatile. And then on the hook systems themselves, you can change the depth that you fish um, by just running a simple bead and then some sort of a tungsten cone on it. So if I was fishing this with, say, an intermediate line um, on top of weeds, um, I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't fish it with any weight on top. But then if I was starting to go deeper, um, I pretty much just slide on a bead here. And then on top of that, just run a cone. I'll rig one up completely. Um, but yeah, so then that just goes on the front of the fly and then you can jig it, it'll go down deeper, you can shorten the leader and it, it, it'll sink really fast. Um, but if you don't have any weight on it with the bucktail and everything, um, it does really good hovering as well. So it's, it's super versatile, it's, they last a long time. I've only lost one fly ever on this system um i know i have that was i have river. flies from <laughs> years ago i mean i yeah. think the bigger challenge honestly is storing the bucktail so it doesn't get disoriented or yes. pressed or matted and we can talk about that again later um bucktail lockers <laughs> yes last thing i want to talk about before we start the fly uh first off welcome everyone uh i just want to say hi to everyone out there i think we got 25 plus people tuned in tonight which is awesome i'm sure that usually that grows as we get going use that chat window and tommy was happy to answer questions about pike fishing he's fished all over northern michigan canada as well i know he has some dream destinations too for for big fish uh we all do but uh use that chat window if if you want you can turn it off if it's distracting that's no big deal and uh let's see Below, in the link to this, uh, in the description of this video, is the material list. So if you want to, if you need to hop over and see what we're what it is we're talking about or reference it, that is available down below the description. And uh, last thing, if you're using the app to watch this, or or excuse me, if you're using your phone to watch this, I recommend the app. It allows you to use the chat. Otherwise, you're you're just stuck watching us. You can't interact. And that's the whole point of this. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tommy. And as glue dries throughout this, um, we will take time to answer plenty of questions because there's a lot of glue. And that's part of why these are Every so layer. durable. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> yep. All right. Take it away. Cool. So, yeah, the, the first thing that I do, um, or I guess the first part of this fly is the tube itself. So, um, as Matt said, I'm, I found that I like to use this quarter inch tubing from Ace Hardware. And the reason I like using that is I found it's really easy when you are rigging, um, it's really easy to fit the loop of everything um, through it. And I'd used smaller tubing before, and we can go over this later on, but I use shrink tubing and to keep it from fraying. And I was finding that smaller tubes, it would often get caught in there. And so it was kind of a pain. Um, so anyways, so I, I started using this quarter inch tubing. I really like it. I'm tying it on an eighth inch saltwater mandrel. Um, yeah. And I start with, I don't know, this is maybe two and a half or three inches, something like that. And it's not a, a perfect fit, but it, it works. Um, yeah. And then I like to start off the fly with glue. <laughs> um, and I'll put a little bit, maybe like, I don't know, it's like three quarters of an inch up. Not a lot, just something for the, the thread to, to seat on. Oh, it's got glue all over. Uh oh. Perfect. Great um, no, nah, I'm good. That's cool. All right. So start, I'll kind of, this is maybe like a half an inch. I'll just kind of start working the thread across to get somewhat of a base that'll start building everything off of. And I'll kind of go back and forth um, and that. And this is 400 denier thread, which I find that I still often break it. <laughs> this, this fly is all about torque. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'll build up just a tiny bit on the back. And I like to do that because in the back of the fly, um, even though it's, it's kind of hidden, um, I like to establish a little bit of a thread base just for durability's sake. Um, so anyways, the first material that we'll throw in is this hackle. Ooh, where's the end of it? There we go. And some of this stuff is really optional. I mean, there's, I have versions of it that's just straight bucktail. Um, I put this on this fly specifically just because the fly itself was a little bit lighter and I liked it, it gave it a little bit extra weight um hold the water a little bit so we'll go ahead and tie in that Stop right there get this out of the way I know I could be spinning this the rotary but I I like being able to pull everything back. And maybe like, what's that, like four, just so it kind of covers. It doesn't, nothing too crazy. Go ahead and tie that in. Lock that down. fly itself is it's pretty simple it's really just layering a lot of this stuff um, and then of course we'll put a little glue on hopefully it won't explode this time <laughs> you got your pliers handy I do, I do. It's, it's so weird. I, I tried opening it and shutting it at home before, right before I came. Man, now it's all over the bottle and on the thumb. Perfect. All right. And sometimes what I like to do just to expedite the drying just a little bit is after I put glue on, I will just tie, go around just a couple more times, um, and then it'll kind of harden in. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Part of the game. Mm hmm. All right. And... So 
So we'll let that dry for just a second. Um, and then the next step will be bucktail. Why that's drying, I will, I will talk about some other options in the tube world. Um, I started tying tubes, I don't know about you, Tommy, but for, for steelhead more than anything. I still have, I still use it, my HMH tube fly adapter. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> this will not work. For that. <laughs> um, and you will see, see exactly why once we finish the fly, and Tommy will actually put the, the hook rig in the back of this fly because the tube itself holds it there. We don't use what's called hook holder tubing, which is usually a really soft, flexible tubing that you can suction the eye of the hook up into. And really the the shank of the hook lives inside this tube. And mm -hmm. I think uh, one question I have up front is how much do you have a, and you, I hope you didn't answer this already, how much space beyond where you start the fly do you leave with the tube? Because that really controls where the, the point and the bend of your hook come out. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, so most of them, like like this fly, for example, like the, the tube itself is only, I don't know, like an inch and a quarter long maybe. Um, and it varies on some of them. But most of the time I would say, I don't know if you can see that, there's probably half an inch of tube. Um, this fly is a little bit bigger. So there's there's maybe about an inch. I don't know if that's visible or not. Yeah, about an inch of tube. So it kind of depends on that. Um, but that leaves your hook. I think I have an unrigged. Well, I can just rig one. Let's see here. I'll just throw this. Yeah, that leaves the, the point of the hook then. Um, just kind of below, kind of kind of in this this zone. So if the bucktail comes out, your hook point is about there. It's like um, a transition zone there. Yeah. Because you don't want. I don't think you want your hook to fight the bucktail for for gap space. I think once it reaches the flashaboo, it's it's easier to get that hook up. I think. I don't know. At least yeah. that's my experience. But. Yeah. So this. This is a little better example. So you can see the hook kind of hanging there. It's kind of just on the edge of the bucktail there. Um, and this is this is a six-aught hook, and it fits really well. The eye of the hook really cinches in. Um, if you were to use, I've used, here's a smaller hook. I think this is a, either a three or a two-aught hook. And what I'll actually use for that is another, I think it's an eighth-inch soft tubing from Ace, and I'll put a little suction, and that'll help. Um, suction it down into the tube but yeah All i right. should mention too i you know to tie the size tubes that tommy utilizes here that this uh hardware store ace uh tubing you're gonna want a mandrel which is the the section of tommy's vice attachment there that inserts into the head that's that pin looking thing now, if, if you don't want to invest in a head, a tube head for your vice, whether it's a Peak or a Renzetti, they are really nice. I recommend it if you do want to get into this. But I, I tie on a, on a pin, for example. I use the large humor needle, I guess, is pin and needle is kind of interchangeable. But, um, and I actually order some XL clear humor tubing, and that's... That works for me, I but I'm not able to use quite as big a hook as Tommy because the eyes tend to be a little bit larger and I they don't suction well into that tubing. It's too big. The mm -hmm. eyes are. So, you know, for most of my, you know, we had a discussion before this thing got started, you know, more on that topic of refinement and tuning things into what size fits well for northern Michigan. And once I figured that out, most of what I fish, you know, I fish smaller lakes. I have a small boat and that works great for me if i need to go bigger we we go to plan b or c so <laughs> if if you have questions about this um about how you can get set up to do some of these and you know maybe you're watching this after we've we've streamed this live leave them in the comments we see all of that um and i can always bounce stuff to tommy he's local mm -hmm. thankfully and usually we're in touch 
whether it's to plan a fishing trip or something <laughs> or, or other things like that. If you didn't know, Tommy is behind our one of our new logos we got going out right now on the new sweatshirt. So uh, multi-talented. Glad to have him here. <laughs> All right. You ready to hop yeah. to the next step? Let's do it. All right. So the next thing is bucktail. So it's good to get it down near the base. Um, it'll prop up a lot better and... and I'll grab, I don't know, I don't know exactly, about that much. I don't know if that's, I don't know if there's a way of, like, yeah, so I've got about, I don't know how much that would be defined as in, <laughs> diameters of a pen or something what would you say in terms about of a pen, a pen. <laughs> right i mean the biggest fear usually is too little um yeah. i mean you'd have to try hard to use too much i think not yeah. not saying go heavy handed but you want you don't want gaps yeah yeah because this this clump will be spread all the way around this which is a quarter inch so it's it's you're covering a little bit of space um and I typically, this is kind of, I'll just typically kind of pat it in my hand, more or less. It doesn't have to be um, perfectly flat, although I can do that if you'd like. Um, yeah, so I'll go ahead. And I'm just going to lay this on top, leaving maybe about a half of an inch overhang. And then I'm going to grip that. And then, oh, this is an important thing. So where I made that little um, kind of ridge of thread that's where i want the thread that i'm about to wrap around i want it to bite into that gap and that's going to kind of help angle up all of the all of the bucktail so let me drop that in and what i'm going to do is just i'm going to go around twice and then i'm going to kind of with the my thumb and fingers just kind of guide everything around and i'll kind of turn turn the vise a little bit and I don't know if you can see this in the camera actually, but you can see where that kind of that base of the thread is and where I'm about to cinch down. Um, and you'll want to just spread it evenly. So you've got it kind of all the way around like that. And then you'll just, this is where the torque comes in. Just start pulling down on it. And this I'll sometimes use the, the rotary function here. And this, just a few times kind of sometimes I'll pull pull some of the the hair back and just kind of work it through um, if you do spin it be careful not to let it go too far down you kind of want to keep the the thread in a not a complete straight line but you want to keep it consolidated and not too spread out and actually pull that a little bit more And then we'll actually use the buck. <laughs> we'll use the stacker for this. So this works great for sliding over, kind of pull everything back. We want it to really just kind of stack um, and push back. And sometimes I'll use the edge of this as well to kind of pack it down just to get a little bit better of a edge on this. Cause you want, you want this to be fairly even. Um, and then I'm going to hold this down, and then I'm going to take this. I'm going to basically go straight out, and then I like to go past just a little bit and then work my way back into the bucktail. And then I'll just start. You go through a little bit of a thread, <laughs> a little bit of thread here. <laughs> and then basically we're just going to make up a base that will keep that pushed back but not too far. We don't want to crush it, but we still want it to um, have somewhat of a profile and, and and push out. So at this point we can kind of start seeing where we're at. And I don't trim any of this. I like to leave all of this stuff in the back just as body. Um, because often after a while storing the flies and, and whatnot, it'll start to 
compress it. Um, but yeah. So a little bit more it's sticking out on this side a little bit. should be about good and sometimes too I mean you can even experiment with having a little bit more on one side than the other um, this this fly won't have crafter in it but you can kind of adapt the fly if you want it to kick more based on how you're putting the material in or or tying it or crafter is really good for that because you can really lump it in underneath and then just trim it on the sides and then you get this nice tall profile um, Anyways, I think that's about good. And then you'll notice I have a lot of hair clips. I'm going to start <laughs> clipping this back, and this will just help keep it out of the way as we're working. So back to the glue, which this is like dripping down the side now. This thing is out of control. And we give me just a, basically give me just... Excuse to buy a new tying mat. That would be... <laughs> Luckily, this one isn't mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's provided. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, we'll just glue this whole thread base. And yeah, these things really, really hold up. Um, and then again, I'll, I'll often, after gluing it, I'll just go over it a couple times, partially just to help kind of speed up the, the drying process itself. Um, and we will let that dry. All right. Uh, we'll open this up to questions. Uh, we'll see if anybody has any questions. Uh, Justin says hi, Tommy, by the way. Uh, hi. we also hi, got Justin. Steve, Rob, <laughs> David. Awesome. All using the chat already. Uh, quick note to Rob, he, he mentioned that he purchased a, uh, HMH tube adapter a few years ago in a few weeks. Let's see, one, two, three weeks. We'll actually be tying steelhead tubes again, and that'll be a great time to break that out and try it for the first time. We'll have uh, shop friend, John Ingham will be here. Uh, and I just talked to him the other day about material lists and, going to tie an intruder and then kind of a I think more of a, a bait fish imitation that they sound great I I want to sit here and tie with with you guys too it's I love doing this this is <laughs> we've been so busy at the shop lately I haven't tied a whole lot but um, I'm working on an article about organizing materials and stuff and having fun with that at least I need so. to do that. Yeah. <laughs> there's no perfect I haven't found the perfect system but I don't know if that exists. I don't know. I'm a drawer guy. I have everything stacked on the lid of a box right now. <laughs> you have an excuse. You just built a new house. I don't know. It's been a little while, but yeah. it's... <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Drawers, binder clips, and uh, Ziplocs are usually my best <laughs> friend. But uh... All right. No questions so far, but we got we got over 40 people tuned in. Uh cool. Chase and Pike. Uh, where's everybody from? Is everybody northern Michigan out there? Are you? Uh, where are you, Chase and Pike? We're we're happy to hear. If we'd also love to hear if you have really really big Pike. Uh, maybe we'll come yeah. see you. Uh, road trip. That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, let's see. So we can hop on to the next step if you're ready. Yeah. I mean, if this step takes a little bit longer to prep, we're gonna get into the flash now. Um, so for this. And again, I, th I think I listed the UV one as optional. I can't remember. I like putting it in there. So this is all the Magnum Flash. So we're going to do a little bit of a combo of some of it. Um, and I use the, the longer flash on the first layer. Um, probably hard to see on the camera, but I'll use that on the first layer. And then we'll put in the bucktail. And then we'll do the, the shorter stuff closer to the head um so i'll just get well this is a mess i'll just get i don't know how many strands this is 
about that amount of each. <laughs> you, you, you can burn through as much flash as you want. Um, really, the only thing that after multiple pike have taken the fly that starts to come off every now and then is chunks of flash in the pike's teeth. Um, so I'll grab, it might be a little easier to see with this one, about that much. Um, I don't know if that's maybe 15 strands, something like that. And I'm cutting, I'm cutting those fairly long for now. We can always trim them down afterwards. Um, so if, if, you know, the flash is too long based on your hook rigs, you know, I'll hold the fly upside down and then just kind of slowly cut down at an angle like this to trim back if needed. Um, and what I've found that I like to do when I get the flash is I'll, I'll, instead of in the center where it comes, I'll slide the zip tie almost all the way to the end so I have the full, full piece to work with. Let's see here. And sometimes I don't end up using all of this. I'll kind of start with an amount and go from there. So here's the three, the three kinds. And what I'm going to do is get out a comb. And basically, from underneath, just start combing it out and then kind of spinning it just to mix it. And this kind of helps straighten it as well. So I'll kind of comb and then twist, comb regroup it and then do the same thing just a couple of times and that's that's pretty good and then I'll also I'll look at the ends and kind of loosely hold it I don't want I don't I want them varied I don't want them all ending in the same spot so that's actually that's actually pretty good um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take half of that so just kind of roughly Roughly divide it here into two parts. I'll set the one down. And then I'm going to take this other half. And this, that's dry enough. And I'm going to take this in half. And actually, I'm going to pull this off for a second and just see where I want the top of the fly. It actually looks like I have longer fibers in it. Top. So I'm going to go with this as the top of my fly. Will you will you talk about that a little bit? What you're looking for to decide the top of the fly? Oh yeah. So just on, on this part, I'm looking at the length of the bucktail, and if I kind of get low and look at this, I almost have more more on top here, and it looks to be just a little bit longer than the bottom part, and I want that. It'll help the fly track better. Right. That it's that. Uh... It's always more buoyant at the top, so, or with the more material, the more buoyant that section is, essentially, so. So, yeah, I'll kind of, I'll remember as this being up is the top of the fly, and then I'm going to go ahead and clip this back again, and then I'm going to take this in half and just put that directly on the top, and again, I'm only going to do maybe around it twice. And then once it's on there, if you take your thumbnail and almost press down on it and kind of wiggle it back and forth, it spreads it out really nicely. And what you're looking for is you want it to cover about that top half of the fly and just kind of spread it out as, as even as possible. And then once you have that about where you want, sometimes I'll, I'll go on top of the thread and just kind of hold it and that gives me a little more control otherwise it can be a little slippery on the glue after it's dried and I'll go around that and then I'll just fold this back on the top and same thing pressing down with your thumb and then a couple times and then make sure and then now I've got this pretty much even just for the top part of the fly and I'll wrap it a couple times and then actually before rotating it take the clip off and then we'll just put the clip over again 
and then flip it to the bottom and then same thing with the last half. So again, kind of hold it in the middle, lay that on the top, and then we'll just go over it maybe about oops, get in the way. Go over it about two times. Yeah. And I'm gonna go over it three times and then same thing. I'm just gonna push down with my thumbnail and then we're gonna just kind of even it out throughout the rest of the fly so it's evenly covered now on this side. And sometimes too, if, it, if it's not cooperating, like right now it's all wanting to go to one side, when I fold over the rest, sometimes if it's difficult to get it all to go one way or spread out perfectly even, I'll kind of have part of it going one way and then when I fold it over, I'll cover in the, the remaining gap. But that's about good. And then go over it a couple more times. And then fold it all back and same thing. Once it's folding back, if you kind of push it down with your thumb, it will help spread it out. And just kind of make sure. And then we'll just cover this fairly, not super heavy, but enough to really lock it down. And then go back kind of again to the, the base of that thread mount and glue it again. And let it dry. And then the next thing will be more bucktail. Well, we will. Uh, we're going to do some some questions here. Why the glue is drying there, and I get my audio levels going, <laughs> not blowing it out there. You could pretty much call this time episode while the glue dries. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. Do do you? Uh, I mean, do you just tie one at a time, or do you tie them I in do stages? One at a time, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if you really wanted to crank them out, you could. I mean, yeah, like you could pop them out. Mandrels and... going. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be like, <laughs> be like Keith Moon behind the drums or uh, Neil Pert with fly tying vices, just running around. <laughs> All right, weird classic rock references. That's where we've gone so far. Uh, we got some great questions though, so I'm gonna hop over cool. there. Um, first of all. Uh, we got a comment from Justin who said his streamer box has somehow become even more unorganized since summer, which I've seen his, we went hopper fishing, it got like right at the beginning of hopper season mm -hmm. on the Boardman. Mm -hmm. I think, was that, I had to have been this year, uh, or last year, and I mean, it was, he needed a shovel for that thing to dig through and find <laughs> stuff, so I don't know how it got more unorganized. Um <laughs> Rob is asking uh, about your thread and mm -hmm. 400 denier. Have you also asked, have you tried gel spun yeah. at all? I mean, what, how did you end up at 400 denier? I so guess? I ended up at, ended at 400 denier. I like how much I can torque down on it. And what I really found that I liked is it builds the thread mounds a lot quicker. It's a little bit wider, so when you're mm. so much of this fly revolves around building these big thread bases um, to tie it off of, or to tie the materials onto, that I found using 400 near you could do that a lot quicker, and you'd burn through a lot of thread otherwise. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I I go I like gel spun. Uh, it's but you're right. It you will you I will burn burn through, through a lot, a lot of gel spun because it, I mean even for the big stuff is only 200 denier. I mean, it's yeah. half of what you're using tonight. Yeah. So, and this, this smart. is the I mean, only fly. These are the only flies I'll use 400. Sure. On. Uh, otherwise. Yeah. It's, it's kind of pointless. <laughs> right. I mean, it's excessive. <laughs> little, little excessive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it makes sense. I mean, it's, and it's also, it's marketed as big fly, I believe mm -hmm. from uni. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we have that in from time to time, uh, 
we'll probably just have primary colors though, black and white. Uh, yeah. Let me hop over to yeah, my. I don't know hold it can... there. I'll switch screens real quick so Wind you can see up. it. Big fly. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, that's uh, that's the main reason. It just yeah. it helps build the heads quicker. And you won't use as much, although there's probably not as much thread on that <laughs> anyways. Right. But it's just a little bit quicker when you're tying the fly. But, and yeah. I, I mean, I know I don't really use much beyond white or black. Do you play with thread color much? No. I don't see a huge I reason pretty much, to, honestly. I've actually, I've come to like white the most because what I've started doing, and we'll get into this more near the end of things, is I've started cutting up... Um, chunks of flash and then i'll actually put it in the epoxy and oh, with cool. using with using the white as a thread base you can see the color a lot more and it's probably unnecessary but it looks cool and it's the same reason i use i mean if even for a dubbed body i i usually prefer white because it doesn't dilute the color if yeah if it, i don't know that's the way i think about it but yeah and when you, if you get into tying a lot of these, you will have an excessive amount of flash and you will have an excessive amount. If once I'm done using this, you will have bags of this, <laughs> yes. which yes. otherwise it's, it's kind of useless. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also had a question from, sorry, I think I'm zoomed out here. Uh, <laughs> uh, HR, I don't know. Sorry. Something the great, um, I was asking about ISOF and where you like to target early season pike and how early you tend to get out. Um, I mean, I've gone as early. I typically fish trout opener. Yeah. I'll go pike fishing. because I do that as well. I'll else. admit that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I it's kind of, it's kind of great. When was and... the last time you heard just, I mean, someone had a banner day on, on trout <laughs> opener. Um, usually it's more getting together and, having beverages with friends on trout <laughs> opener i think then yeah i think the last fishing. trout opener that i fished trout it was just sleeting and not good trout weather but great pike weather um yeah yeah it's, I feel like it's connor who's asking the question thanks for the clarification but uh, <laughs> about early season yeah yeah no i'll i'll typically go out trout opener as soon as i'm able to um i still haven't made it up to canada for may long weekend that's on the to-do list i think that's We've i saw it up there that, is still yeah. there's a lot of snow on the ground um hopefully hopefully this year that could potentially happen but yeah yeah and and i think one of the challenges we find for us is when pike opens for us in michigan it i granted it is <laughs> like eight fifteen. like my brain's a little fried but <laughs> Unless I've missed something, it's the same as the trout opener. Yep, same as the trout opener. So you, we're not quite as able to fish our favorite spots on ice out, but what we can do is go fish the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. So we can go fish, you know, around rock walls and marinas and river mouths and things like that, early season ice out, which most people do not do. I mean, no, no way. Er, you know, the last thing... I mean, remember when we go, we go uh, lake trout fishing, yes. like at ice out on yeah. the bay <laughs> in low float tubes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should try the Maybe pike thing. I don't know. Yeah. I've seen some amazing pike come out of early season marinas, yeah. and, you know, you're not worried about boats being in there, yeah. fighting around the boat. So, yeah. Um, and around docks and stuff. Oh, Jake is saying, uh, don't spoil that trout opener trick. Yeah. Well, I know Jake is an expert pike angler if if it is uh mr belner down south <laughs> who caught his first pike this year so <laughs> uh let's see we got some other questions uh real quick um i know we're kind of we're having fun we're talking about this stuff and, uh let's see uh christian says that he does not personally pike fish but he appreciates how cool the flies look and i have to agree uh, with that um <laughs> Uh, we did have a question from CK uh, regarding stripping speed and technique matched with temperature, which is a big discussion on its own. Oh, um, man. I feel like... Is there, do you have a quick and fast rule? How about that? Whatever's working on that given <laughs> so day. Guess it's and a, check, right? I feel I mean, like it's so, it varies so much. I mean, you can have what you would 
go out and think is going to be, oh, it's going to be a, a slow streamer. You, everything's going to be just slow, turning, hovering, and it doesn't do anything. And then you find that, you know, quick retrieval. I would say my favorite is once you have it um, set up with a bead and a cone head, I kind of just like to do almost an in-between. And that's okay. kind of my go-to is not not slow, not fast, kind of medium pace and kind of an erratic, you know, like, stream sure. or well, retrieve it's almost the goldilocks effect right where the medium appeals to hopefully the most amount yeah. of fish out there you yeah. know early season you're gonna see non-committal fish yeah you, they're gonna follow all the way to the boat and then sometimes a sudden burst of speed yeah get some and i what i really like I mean, to do too again with with that here's a massive flies so here here's a rigged setup and once once you have everything from the tail to the bead and this, if I'm doing like you know like a quick strip retrieve and then pause, quick strip retrieve then pause, the fly itself is going to be doing this like fast dart up and then it's going to pause and then it's going to start sinking and this tail is going to be doing a slow turn. So in essence, you're really kind of covering both areas, and I more than often find that they'll hit as it's dropping. Well, I think that's a it's kind of a lead into a really good point that these flies are designed to fish on their own as well, not just under uh, tension from the angler. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's important. A lot. Some people are, are so quick to just rip these flies back. Yeah. And, but you spent these, the time to build these flies that fish on their own. Yeah. You know, the pause is, the is pause probably is... the most underappreciated yeah. thing in yeah. streamer fishing, whether it's musky pike, I mean, trout, you name it, it's the pause and how you use it. It's, it's a tease for fish. Mm -hmm. So, And a lot of these flies, how they're built and why we're making all of these, you know, big thread mounds throughout the fly itself is when it does pause. I mean, the fly is kind of turning like this in the water. And when it pauses, it's going to puff back up, which just looks awesome. Um, and if, if you are fishing wiggle tails too, I mean, that's going to be doing this turning motion and the combination of that is great. And again, if you're fishing with, um, a cone head and it's dropping that wiggle tail is doing this, the fly is pulsing, even if you're not, um, retrieving it. So it, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, how how is the glue We're ready doing? for the next one. Let's I hop mean, to the next one. There's still some questions. We'll come you back can, to your you questions. Can, so keep asking. Yeah, you can keep letting me know what the questions yeah. are as i'm tying i mean okay. this is this is literally we're just repeating the same exact thing um with blue bucktail i i like to do two different colors just to kind of blend it so each fly almost like fades in um you can see on this one it's more of a white to green to black um this is kind of a variant with um schlaffen in it um this one started with white in the back then went to the chartreuse um, but yeah, yeah, if there's other questions, like this is kind of a, sorry, my volume's down. This is a revisit of something we touched mm -hmm. on, but, uh, rod weights. Yeah. Uh, so I, I typically know, fish pike. a 10 weight for everything. And that's, that's really just for ease of castability. I mean, when you get these, this one, the one that we're tying isn't, isn't bad to cast on an eight weight. I mean, if you're used to casting smaller flies the first time you ever cast one of these, it is kind of like casting a wet sock. And if, right. if you have a wiggle tail on it, you'll have this like, you know, windy flapping sound. And it's, yeah, it's not going to cast different. like a, like a sex dungeon <laughs> or something. No. I mean, even pick a, pick a heavy trout streamer. It's not going to fish like that. It's just, I think it's, <laughs> you expect because every, every recommendation out there is for a super fast rod that, you don't have to wait much and there's a there's a waiting game in in pike casting in my mind because mm -hmm. you're trying to it's distance casting you're covering as much water as possible mm -hmm. and, i mean i don't know i would just wear myself out and my joints out if i was just you know trying to cast things <laughs> as fast as possible i see guys using fiberglass rods yeah and slower action rods for pikes so. yeah yeah and my my cast it's when i'm casting these all day it's not sometimes it's kind of a modified cast it's not 
it's not the most conventional maybe like sometimes i'm casting more to the side just to get it going and it's a it's a double haul type thing where you get the line close enough up to the head and then you pull it back out and then a single haul to shoot it you don't want to be you know false casting a bunch <laughs> no if you can <laughs> especially if it's false windy casting, yeah <laughs> and there's someone else in the boat yeah they don't feel horrible. good. When, yeah, they do not feel good when you haul one of them into your back. No, or your and there's head. there's not a lot of space between you, or it's a, like a a pedal boat or something like. <laughs> sorry, that's a per, that's an inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, casting and in with the lines. My favorite line to cast them on is the Airflow Streamer Max Short in a 10 weight, just because I like how heavy the head is on the line. Um, it turns it over really well. Not that you're you're not you're not roll casting these at all, but just getting the line up to the boat, I'll sometimes kind of lop the line over just to get it close to the surface and oh, yeah. then go from there. It's it's um, the same thing we do if we're if we're swinging flies with a bunch of T14. Sometimes you'll just throw a roll cast to bring the line to the surface before you start your cast right i mean mm -hmm. so and we did have a question about tips if you're getting started um mm -hmm. with pike fishing and not to i mean it's a bit of a self-promotion i guess but we do have one or two <laughs> uh intro to fly fishing for pike videos out there as well on our page i i would encourage you to check out um but i'll turn that to Tommy too like what what are I don't know do you have any tips for someone just getting started tying or pike fishing I think a lot of these questions are 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 more towards fishing these flies I mean luckily you can buy some of these if you if yeah you yeah you can definitely time, buy so. some of these and I mean when I started um pike fishing I was fishing more oh, what's the name of them just like big zonker like, oh it's the it's um, a pike bunny pike bunny yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me tell you that thing still catches yeah. fish it's yeah. uh barry reynolds yeah I, check him out if you want some some og uh pike action barry reynolds has he wrote at least one book there's a dvd out there um russ madden tried to get me to buy this thing on amazon it, like used it was like 50 dollars <laughs> for this dvd but he was like it's the coolest thing you've ever seen <laughs> so um it, even the old basic stuff like those pike bunnies they work you yeah but you i've noticed this i'm sure tommy's noticed this that we both love to tie but um there's not a ton of these style flies available in the u.s market no. at shops for sale a lot of what you see is marketed more towards musky anglers which tend to use a lot more feathers which uh, that's a whole heartbreaker thing in my mind we don't use a ton of feathers because pike shred them i mean they their teeth man they will shred they shred stuff up and these 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 materials hold up really well with them um and you know too you could always tie this on a hook. It doesn't have to be on a tube. You know, I mean, once once that hook, if that gets bent out, then you're kind of done with the fly itself. And part of the charm of tying it on the tube is you can just swap it out every time you need to. Um, but you can definitely tie these on a big hook. Yeah. And they don't have to be massive streamers, too. I mean, I, I, I really think the sweet spot for these flies is roughly that length. That's maybe... I don't know what seven inches right. kind of in that yeah. zone yep. and i typically i will fish the smaller sized wiggle tails more than the big tails just because right. i like the action of them yeah um but so yeah so this was the same exact um same exact step as before with the first amount of bucktail so getting it tied in pulling it back and then just building another another big thread around here how much excess do you leave in the back of your bucktail i mean is there a reason i mean i've seen people cut it almost flush to where the thread is I, yeah i find I, a durability thing i mean really if you're yeah. layering it like that uh, i like that... it as the body of the fly yeah i mean i think for some flies, if I if I want to fly, that's going to be slower in the water. 
and, and again, you can kind of go all over the place with this, but if I go into fishing a certain spot that I know I want to fish really slow, I'll leave a bunch of it in and I'll even, I think is it this one, I think this one. Yeah, no, no, I guess it was another one, but I'll, I'll have like, I'll tie in like three things of bucktail just to have a little bit more in the center and it just makes it more buoyant basically so as it's going through the water column if you have that pause it can just be this long drawn out pause and it's just hovering there which works really great sometimes um but yeah i i like to leave a lot i i don't trim it Just get a bunch thread built up here. It's that it's that back and forth motion that really helps build that cone, if you will, mm -hmm. of thread. I mean, I've I've seen some people. Uh, well, nope, I've done it. How about that? I, where I've just tried to wrap a bunch of thread right in front of it as a dam, and it'll collapse if you don't mm -hmm. build up the support behind it. And I'll often, as I'm building up the the head, if I kind of go back and forth like Matt was saying. And then after doing that a few times, I'll go back right to the edge and then do a few wraps there. And that kind of like locks that in and it really pushes the, the bucktail back. So I'm gonna clip this back again. And yeah, this is definitely a little long. We'll, we'll trim this down. You could leave it like this if you were not fishing a wiggle tail, if you wanted. Um, but again, I feel like that Kind of that perfect length for a fly is just a little bit shorter than all of this. So, there it is again. Are there any other questions? There's a bunch of questions. Man, yeah, cool. This is great, guys. Um, <laughs> we've had some where there's almost no questions, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of awkward and we have to ad lib and. We bring all of a sudden Olivia Newton John's part of the the deal, and if you if you saw last week's episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, let's see. Let me hop over. I can't read on my phone. Let me hop over to my other screen. So, uh, okay. Justin is asking: Does casting the tube style flies feel any heavier than a traditional shank style fly, or do they feel about the same to you? If I'm doing a double jointed pike fly, so like two hooks, it feels lighter than that. I mean, if you have a single hook and you're tying the pike fly onto that single hook, I guess depending on the profile of the fly would really determine that. Sure. But I'd say it's fairly comparable. And and again, I mean, the difference between casting this fly, it's going to feel a lot lighter, and then casting, where is it? Like this fly will feel a lot heavier. I mean, it really just depends on the material. Like a fly like this, it's going to feel really comparable to, you know, like a right. pike bunny. It's, it's, it might, it's, I would almost say it's lighter than a pike bunny. It just has a little bit well, more it, profile. It sheds the water. Yeah. Whereas yeah, a, does, really. a rabbit's going to hold it, which yeah. can be great if you're, if you're not worried about catching weeds and you want to fish really slow. Again, bunny is probably the best natural material. It, like flashaboo, it keeps moving on its own it just keeps wiggling mm -hmm. and i i think the other thing is with this tube fly you're typically using a larger main hook mm -hmm. than you would two tandems and mm -hmm. they tend to equal out I, I think in weight for the most part um mm -hmm. let's see uh we got some other questions uh christian asked what the lightest fly rod is i will i will personally handle that one um Good thing Doc isn't watching this because he'd probably g blow a gasket about about the zero weight rod and how it define <laughs> defies physics. <laughs> Nothing can weigh zero, right? But um, <laughs> that's a whole. Uh, hopefully, everyone's laughing about that with me as well. But uh, usually, you're not going to see anything lighter than a two. The reason I, I my guess is he's asking to get a scale where that ten weight is. And the most common scale is from a 1 all the way up to a 16. Now, I've cast a 16-weight rod. Um, <laughs> it's 
imagine casting a two by four. That, yeah. But it's built for, I mean, immense loads. It's not a casting rod. It's it's a fighting rod, and it's built to fish big saltwater flies yeah. um, and fight big saltwater fish like marlin, things like that. A 10 weight is, is heavier, and you're not going to find as much use for it in northern <coughs> Michigan. I will say a 10 weight is great for king salmon as well. So, you know, think about... You know, if yeah. you're looking for an excuse to buy a ten weight, you can use it for more than just pike. I mean, a, a nine oh nine would be great too. A nine's a killer rod. Yeah. It's a great crossover steelhead king and pike rod, yeah. especially if you're fishing smaller lakes, yeah. more reasonable size flies, if you will. Yeah. Um, I I also fish a ten most of the time. It just makes a full day out there. It'll cast anything I need. I don't have to switch rods. Mm-hmm. So. Um, we did have a brief question or a comment about fishing gear. And mm-hmm. I know that one of the cool things about Tommy is that he fishes more than just flies. And I think he's able to learn and glean a lot of things from the spin world mm-hmm. and the casting world and apply it to his, his fly stuff. Will you talk a little mm-hmm. bit about what you would use spin wise and yeah. why you do the spin stuff here and there too? So Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of times I'll switch to spin stuff if either the pike are too deep or sometimes they're not taking the fly and I just, I want to try other things or I'm just kind of experimenting or seeing what's working in the lake. Um, you can certainly cover a lot bigger distance with spin gear, um, bombing crankbaits out super far or whatnot. Um, but a lot of times, like with, with what we were talking about earlier with that, you know, that like retrieval style of, you know, kind of quick strips and then pauses, a lot of that came off of finding that, slow twitching a a big little cleo spoon across the bay actually worked better than just about anything else and then starting to do that type of retrieval on the fly um started working better so often i'll i'll kind of switch around with that kind of thing um just to kind of explore and 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 fish more before switching to you know, or starting to tie different things based on what I'm finding works. Um, otherwise, like if I'm up in Canada, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you're up there and the lake is, you know, 80 feet deep and it's a little too deep. And yeah, so troll giant <laughs> crank baits or jerk, you know, jerk baits, sure. stuff like that. Yeah. And it's just fun. I mean, a lot of times it's kind of whatever it is to catch pike um, between the two. So early mornings, they'll fish bays and shallower areas with the with the flies or if there's reefs or um rock piles out in the lake fish right. that and then um once you've hit all those spots and switch over and go a lot deeper sure and and that's that's a good point is as pike are daily movers yeah they're and i mean that <laughs> throughout the day where you know it, you just cannot expect to catch them in the same spot all day no. because the water conditions change, the temperature changes, the light changes, and you need to be able to, to adapt. And mm-hmm. it's cool that you can do that and jump around and try different things. Uh, we did have uh, a question about color schemes, mm-hmm. really, really natural schemes versus um, more attractor schemes. I tend to fish a lot more attractor schemes. I actually really like blue and chartreuse i found that to be a really good color combination but i do think a lot of it depends on the lake that you're at too i mean certain lakes like the one lake in canada blue and orange works great i've had more luck on blue and orange than any other color combination up there which i'd never i'd never look at a a forage base and be like yep blue and orange yep definitely (laughs) no yeah it's it's kind of a weird combo but it it's for whatever reason and that could be if you know, the water is a lot clearer up there. Um, some lakes, it's a little more stained. I mean, it can be it can be different. I feel like lakes around here, often green and gold work really well. That's yep. kind of a Yellow great... as well, yeah. I've noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I fish a lot of chartreuse. Um, if it's cloudy or lower light, I'll tend to fish um, black. I think black is always a great color. And, I mean, of course, white and red. I think we've covered pretty much all the colors now at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but what's cool about the wiggle tails is that you can have two colors. So sometimes I'll be fishing a bright fly, but then I'll have a dark tail or vice versa. Or I'll be fishing a fly that has a black body to it, 
and then I'll be fishing a bright chartreuse tail on it or an orange tail. Contrasting. Yeah, yep. contrasting, and then you'll get both. And sometimes that can can work out great if you're not sure what's. What As if we didn't have enough variables for everyone to play with. Yes. <laughs> Let's yes. play with color. <laughs> Let's switch up your tails, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> um let's see what else do we got uh connor chimed in that sage at one point probably made a triple lot uh a triple zero and if if i remember correctly that's that sounds about right i remember at least a double zero which again <laughs> is it negative two is it triple zero what? i don't know that's that's such a tangent for another time uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll call Doc and just have him rant about that. <laughs> Everyone can listen to it. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week. <laughs> Actually, next week we have Russ coming in. Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> Which, if you guys haven't, I'm so excited to have a live chat with Russ Madden. It's going to be hilarious. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> man's a, just so much fun to talk to. Um, let's see. Uncovered Colors. Uh, Rob is asking where Olivia is tonight, and I believe she's spending time with Brian. Uh, that or, or Marilyn is crafting something out of her, I guess. Which is, I'm a little disappointed. I think she should permanently be in the in the back office uh, for everybody trying close or something. <laughs> um, Christian say he fights King Salmon on an eight weight. Which Salmon, in my opinion, this is a I'm going to go really short with this tangent. Salmon, it's all about room to fight the fish you can catch a salmon on a light rod if you have a room to fight the fish they're just too powerful for a lot of our small rivers like the betsy where mm -hmm. you got wood and you got <laughs> another obstacle uh people mm -hmm. no and other people fishing so you need as much backbone sometimes 10 weights not enough so we tends the standard at least in northern michigan uh if you have room to fight a salmon on an eight weight that's awesome uh, let's see. Lee is asking if we would share our favorite pike waters in northern Michigan. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Flat out, no. <laughs> Lee, if you want to stop in the shop, uh, I'd be more than happy to at least draw some large circles on a map for you. I'm, yes. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, but, large uh, circles. Yes. It's There's, there's a lot, actually. There's, there's, there's a lot of good spots. so yeah. many. That's what I love about these all our small lakes. Mm-hmm. We don't have the big bass boats. You don't have – you have one guy in a canoe, and mm -hmm. there's a paddle board, and you're out there by yourself yeah. just and there's a lot of spots. fish. It's fun. Oh. Yeah, and a lot of those spots don't even allow motors. Exactly. And yeah. it's great, um, yeah. and they're accessible. Some of them you can even just wade, um, but, yeah. <laughs> we ready for the yeah. step – all right. Uh, any special tools for this this next step? So this one, no. We'll get into a little bit more complex dubbing stuff with some of the final flash. But this flash, um, this is a the saltwater flashaboo. Um, we're just going to cut, I don't know, maybe six or eight pieces off. We can kind of go as needed. But we're just going to manually put these in around the fly just to get that um, that part in. And then we'll go to the rest after that. So I'm going to cut. I don't know. We'll start with. You can, if you really want to, put all of these in a dubbing loop. But it can start to get a little little intense if you got like four different types of flash in a dubbing loop. <laughs> but anyway, so what we're going to do here, this is pretty simple, is we're going to take these. And you don't want them, again, you don't want them ending on the same spot. You kind of want them staggered. So if it's off just a little bit, and what I do is just kind of, yeah. Oh, sorry. So you want them a little bit uneven, and I'll often just kind of pull it over like that, and that'll get a little crease. And then when I go on, I'll just kind of put that onto my thread here and then get it hooked into that crease. And pretty much just lay it on there. So we were top and bottom. And so what we'll do is just lay that in, go on over, and then I'm just going to pull them pull them apart just a little bit, not too far. And then we're going to do that a few times, kind of on the, on the sides and the top and bottom. So same, same type of thing here, somewhat uneven. 
not too far apart. Um, make a little crease, drop it on the thread here. And just kind of lay that in. And then once you have it in, just kind of, here, if I can see that a little better, pull it down a little bit. And we'll just do that on all four sides. Any other questions? This is, this is pretty straightforward, this part. Ron is asking if uh, we think his nine foot six eight weight uh, would work with oh, yeah. some practice. Yeah. I think so. Oh yeah, I, honestly, you can do a lot with an eight weight. I fished an eight weight for a long time with a lot of these, and I'll I'll still bring an eight weight with me, you know, yeah. mostly as a backup rod. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can certainly fish an eight weight, and that and would you're, be... you're not gonna break your rod on pike. Really, no. it's just it's just ease of casting. The, yeah. The one big downside, honestly, Ron, that you're going to run into with a, a little bit longer eight weight rod. Once you go beyond that nine foot rod, every six inches you add slows your rod down, which means it's unless you've got you know some sort of you know super stiff graphite, but usually those longer rods slow down. They're great for roll casting. Uh, it's a killer steelhead rod, but don't never think that something you have isn't going to work. I, I tell almost everyone at the shop, try what you have first and then go decide if you need a better tool for the job. Because how are you going to know unless you try what you have already? Yeah, and I've even, very slow casting, but I've even used a uh, seven weight switch rod with, I think sure. I think I was using my ten weight line on it. Very slow casting, but oh, it goes once you get it, it going, though. Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> uh, John's asking. He missed the very beginning and is asking if we're using the Bauer rig. Yes. Yep. 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 Did you talk about? Um, that stinger fly or that stinger hook versus no no stinger hook at all and i'm a big fan of the stinger hook i find that the the stinger hook more than often i that's what i have the fish hooked on more than often yeah so usually we see these fish uh, you know kind of attack it perpendicular a lot of times and you know so from the side if you will t-bone mm -hmm. and a lot of time it's that is that back hook that gets on yeah. it for sure. Because so many times, too, you'll have pike follow the fly up to the boat or wherever that is, and you'll be able to watch it happen, which is super cool when it does happen. And sometimes they'll look at it, they'll follow it, and then they'll kind of go away or back off. And then a lot of times they'll kind of come back in and do that side swipe. And a lot of times that's that's like they'll just hit the side of the fly, and then they'll hit the, right. the trailer hook. Yep. So... So basically what I've done here is kind of gone around and evenly coated all the sides, just doing it simple like this. Um, and then once I have that, I'm just going to go over it a couple times, just kind of lock all of that in. Like that. And because we're doing the dubbing loop next i'm not going to glue on this layer because it'll get really slippery and can kind of be <laughs> frustrating sometimes getting that that to to lay in um yeah so yeah to get the dubbing loop ready i like to use this opst dubbing loop tool or whatever the spinner i can't remember what the name is um so we'll make a dubbing loop here around a couple times and move the thread forward so trim that drop that in just drop that there for now and 
this, we're just going to use that blue and the Mirage um, regular flash. And this, you can, I mean, you can be pretty generous on this. <laughs> So this is, since we're only doing two, I'm using a little bit more than before. Um, that's a rough, roughly that amount. You you burn through a lot of this. <laughs> yes, I've I've under underdone it more than once with the with the dubbing loop, unfortunately. <laughs> so I'm just gonna lay that down, and unlike before, where we mixed it. Um, I'm going to do kind of one in front of the other. I'll probably do the blue on the outside and the mirage on the inside just to kind of mix it up and contrast a little more. And again, too, I mean, you can go light on this, but the one part of the fly that over time will slowly start to, you'll see bits and pieces in the pike's teeth when you catch them. Um, and it's the flash. This is typically what what gets eaten. Um, all right, so I'm laying that out. And what I want to do before I start putting that in is making sure that I kind of make these a little bit uneven. I don't want them to be, this one's pretty good. Um, I don't want them to be flat. I want it to kind of vary. So... Do the same thing here and just kind of pull pull some of it out until it's not not perfectly even. That one's a little bit. If you get one that's super long, just pull it out and re-add it back in. And when we do put these in the dubbing loop, it might be a little difficult to see on my side. I'm not going to put them centered. I'm going to put them just slightly off center to create a little bit more of a cone going back when we start pulling it back. Um, if we were to just fold it over half, we're going to start to have almost too much of a uh, triangular head. We want it to kind of all taper back along the body of the fly. Right. You don't want straight edges. No. Basically. No, it's not interesting. Because that, that taper, when you're, when you're fishing it, it's that taper going back that just shimmers and shines as it's going through the water. Um, so anyways, set that to the side. And put dumbing wax here. How much wax do you usually use? Not a lot. Not a lot. Um, just enough so it's not sliding all over the place, which it can very easily. It this, can. This it, can which go... can be good and bad, though. Yeah. In my, <laughs> I, I, like, I feel bad. I keep jumping in, too. But oh, no, no. I, I don't know. For me, I've almost gotten away from wax, like as as little as possible, because I can't. Sometimes it clumps up, and I mm -hmm. you'll see what we're talking about here. Um, <laughs> it it won't clump up with Tommy tying it, but it can clump up, and you mm -hmm. won't be able to slide things mm -hmm. as quite as easily because they bind together, which yeah makes for a more durable fly. But I guess if it's more if I'm doing one dubbing loop. And that's it instead of maybe a two or something mm -hmm. like that, I guess. But So I'm going to put oops, this one piece here. I'm not going to spread these out at first. I'm just going to put, put one in the front here roughly. And this is where it can get a little tricky, especially when you've had glue on your fingers. <laughs> It'll probably be a little hard to see this from that side. Um, We've yet to bring in the overhead cam, but maybe next year. Maybe season two, live fly time. Ah, that glue on my finger is making it stick. There we go with the first one. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll just pinch it like this and kind of go through and then direct the rest of it. And then drop that in. And then, so I've got kind of those two groups there, and then I'll really just start spreading this out a little bit. And then once I'm kind of in this phase, this is where I'll start to 
kind of pull it a little off centered um, so that you don't have that that cone but it's a lot easier to do it now versus before when you're trying to put it in just a little little more commentary it's important to notice that, that Tommy's holding that that thread of the dubbing loop horizontal if you try and do this while it's vertical you're gonna have issues it, it will it will fall in your lap and all over the floor and yeah holding it straight in back towards you that that's the best thing you can do because then it's not going to slide one way or the other so that's pretty good there spread that out just a little bit more this is the finicky part but that should work and then there, I'm just going to go ahead and start spinning this and then kind of all at once let it, let it start spinning. And once I get it about there, I'm going to start picking this out so it doesn't get too clumped. That's a great tip instead of just spinning it all the way. Yeah, I like to... I'd say this is spun maybe between half and three fourths of the way of how much I'm ultimately going to spin it, but um, with this length, um, with all the flash, it once it gets to a certain point, it's really hard to un untangle it. Um, so I'll I'll clean it up like this, spin it just a little bit more, um, and then and then keep going. So Bodkin, your preferred tool for this versus a brush or something else i i like this just because the flash pieces are so big compared to like actual dubbing or fibers or anything like that i think this this gets in really easily i find it doesn't pull stuff out either yeah yeah that's, i think that's the big advantage so this takes just a second and then and then once we've done this, I'm just going to spin it one more time. I'm going to tighten that a little bit. And that's, that's about, about where we'll want it. So I'm just going to pick it out once more, which is not as bad this time now that we kept it clean. Oops. Sorry, I had to bring up not... <laughs> Not catch, not tangling, right? But. Oh no! It's <laughs> <laughs> There's another trick I know you'll probably show us with uh, another tool here once you once you spin it in. Hmm? The scissors. You ever play? With, you ever use the scissors once no. you once you well once you dub the dub the loop, I guess. Oh. To run the scissors through it. Oh no, I haven't. Oh yeah. If there's hmm. any tangles. Huh. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like just yes, yeah, yes, yes. I have done that. Sorry. Um, all right. So at this point, now that we've worked all of that out, the best thing to do is <laughs> lick your hand, <laughs> which is great with COVID. <laughs> but if you get some some spit on this, it'll really help kind of keep it all in one direction, which makes it a lot easier once you start putting this on. And I'm just gonna kind of get my thread out to the side there and then holding this all this way I'm going to start wrapping it and the first wrap I like to keep it close to the edge of the deer hair and then once I've once I've established one like that then I'll start working forward and then just kind of pulling everything back as we go which can be a little challenging sometimes with all the flash. It's all about taking your time. Yeah. Yeah. This. Roughly about like that. So 
bring the thread back, get this all clear. I'm going to pass that over and get that locked in. Once that's locked in, I like to pull this back and go over this a couple times. I can pull that out. Trim that. And then pull everything back and then I'm just going to kind of go around a couple times to lock it in. And then we're going to put on that lateral scale and then get the head ready for the eyes. Oh yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. <laughs> Do that a couple times here. So I'll get about that clip back off but yeah you can see we're starting to get that nice gradient from the blue to the chartreuse to the silver to the uv um yeah we had a comment that looks like uh boise state colors <laughs> <laughs> you know that blinding blue field oh <laughs> let's see let me pop over and see if we got any more questions yeah. uh Casey says hi. Uh, hi. Shout out to Casey. So, uh, <laughs> hi, Casey. He, we, he was the uh, original. We tried to use his computer first, and that's uh, oh, <laughs> it didn't work out so well. So, <laughs> so all that homework he was working on, I, I swear. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's see. Not too many more. Keep the questions coming, everybody. If you're if you're where Tommy's happy to answer them. I'm yeah. happy to jump in. How many in, people are obviously. tying? Yeah, is anybody tying along with us? I know this is a little bit different Since setup, the, but <laughs> anybody doing this on a hook or anything? Uh, we'd, I hope you'll you know, tag us on Instagram or something uh, with that. We're at the Northern Angler, of course, if you don't know already. But uh, So... So the, the next step here, before I do the last layering of glue, is the lateral scale. I'm going to take two of these, um, and as you would expect, put them on the sides. So we had determined that this was going to be the top of our fly. Um, so again, making sure that they're not the exact same length. I'm going to kind of roughly get that, and then put that on the side here. And see when I when I put them in, I don't want them directly on top of each other, so I'll kind of angle them out, angle them out a little bit there. Get that locked in. Do the other side here. Then I'm just going to kind of go over everything a little bit more. I'm going to go down just a tiny bit so there's room for the eyes. Actually, I'm going to not that far. There we go. And then just because it's kind of the the final final check through all right and then from there i just kind of do this a couple times and all of this gets a lot of glue or the epoxy on top of it um so i'll do that 
wants. Actually, there's a spot here I want to hit. That's pretty much it on the on the body. So once we have that, go ahead and trim that. And that's minus the eyes. That's that's kind of the fly there. I'll definitely. So that's like uh, what would we go through like six packs of flash boo for this fly? <laughs> <laughs> so, no. You think the fly shop at our cell, you know. You'd think we designed this fly to sell stuff, but this catches fish and they're durable. I they're, mean, they're they're super so durable. So more durable than they than uh you know a, a musky fly full of feathers. It's they just last. These and last. if you take care of them, yeah, they're great. You can all. I mean, have you ever glued eyes back onto a fly? No, I think I have. I think the <laughs> like, only the only time I have. I think I had one that had those like googly eyes that move, <laughs> and a, pike a doll tooth, eyes. A pike I tooth believe that. actually ripped off the front of it, so it was yep. just the back of that, not even the eye itself. Like half of it got ripped off. Sure. And there was like tooth punctures, and it filled up with water, and it finally all <laughs> fell off. But other than that, no, I don't. I don't think I've ever. That's the. That's one of the the cool things is you're gonna have these flies for a long time, mm -hmm. which also can be. I don't know. I've had this. I'm curious if Tommy's had this where you go through you go through stages in your tying mm -hmm. and there's things you've done in the past you decide you're not going to do anymore. Yes. Ziploc bags. Yeah? <laughs> Tell me more. I yeah. have Ziploc bags of old flies or old generations of pike flies that went from sure. fishing to the new iteration and then those kind of cycled out into a series of not well organized Ziploc bags that are in a cabinet <laughs> minor in um my wife gets my wife runs a company and she has all these i mean she gets a lot of raw products um and i have these envelope boxes i probably have two or three that are just full of flies in my <laughs> room and the, i can't tell you how many i've thrown these aren't all pike flies but trout flies everything mm -hmm. i mean i just Same. cycle through and yeah i used to slice things off and retie oh, them yeah. And, yeah yeah there's you know, a handful of them yeah have flies in there that are half pulled apart because then I decide I want to do something else. Sure. And yeah. That's What's a material you used to love that you no longer like? I, I hmm. luckily for me, I can I can probe Tommy a little bit with these because I've we've tied together, we've yeah. fished together for years, so I I can guess at a few things he'll say. But I'm curious, what's um, what's one you used to just love that you don't use anymore? I don't use as much craft fur. I, I I have a lot of it. I really like it still, but I actually, I, th I would say the last multiple iterations um, of these flies, I've kind of gotten away from it um, and just gone to straight flash. Um, I don't know why. I just, well, I mean, well, I, I guess I should you've say. You've gotten a lot better, though, at, at I don't know, um, at finding a way to take the next step beyond that dubbing loop. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of our flies used to just end at the dubbing loop, and then it, you blast some eyes on there, and you're good. <laughs> Your flies look a lot more finished with the steps you take after the dubbing loop nowadays than they used to. With mm -hmm. that, with that saltwater flashaboo, with the lateral scale things mm -hmm. like that, it it looks yeah. a lot more finished and I don't know, elegant, if you yeah. will. Like I'll still you, I guess I'll, I mean I'll still use craft for some. Like like here's one that has craft for on it. And I'll still experiment um, with the craft fur, like based on how I tie it in, stack it, and then trim it on the sides. And you'll get more of a, I don't know if you can see that, more of a high profile on that. And this one is disproportionate in that I left more excess on this side than this side, which then causes it to kick when you pause as you're retrieving it. So I don't know. I guess I still use craft fur, but the latest ones that I've tied more of are you know, ending with flash or even this one just ended with straight bucktail itself. Um, more dull. So I'm trying to think of other. Do you have a, I'm, uh, I'm just going to shoot in mm -hmm. other questions. Do you have situations where flash flies like these 
don't work well where you go to the bucktail, the more natural colors. Um, mm. Not necessarily natural, but more of a natural finish, if yeah, you will, the bucktail like, finish versus the this, versus the flash finish. This is probably the the most natural finish that I would have fished, really. I mean, even that still has the UV and, and silver, but it's definitely more natural appearing than some of these other ones. Um, but not really. I... I think there's something with the, I mean, Pike just like flashy things. Yep. And I think depending on what color variant that you have based on the day and the the weather and the watercolor and all of that visibility, I think it really just comes down to that. Sure. Um, but yeah, most, most all of them have a fair amount of flash in them. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, Chris Doyle says, hi, how you doing, Chris? Hello. Um, he says it looks great. Uh, he's just hoping he'll be able to afford to tie it. Well, Chris, <laughs> you know, you know, stop buying camera stuff and just uh, save it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> save up for more fun. I understand the camera obsession. <laughs> Tommy does too. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. Tommy's who hole. I who I text when I have camera questions too. So, and uh, honestly, with a lot of these, I mean. I mean, yeah, you bur you burn you do burn through a lot of material, but you don't need that many flies. Even though we probably have more than we need, anyways. I mean, it's not like certain flies that you tie with expecting to lose half of them. You really tie a, a handful of them, and I mean, I still have flies from years ago, and I still fish them, right. and especially the tube flies because they don't. They really don't wear out. So it is more of a long-term investment than your typical fly that I might lose this or I probably will lose sure. this at some point. I mean, you'll if, if it's stuck in reeds, you can literally pull yourself over to the fly just pulling. I mean. That's true. Oh, yeah. And it, it won't break off. You'll bend I out love the hook. In the middle of the day, oh, I hooked a log, <laughs> whatever. I bent out my stinger. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah. that fly's working. Just change out the rig. Yeah. Um, back yep. in action and you can go home and just sharpen all the rigs mm -hmm. up and toss the ones that i don't know i go through rigs and it all depends on what wire you're using in the back yeah. you know i think that uh what is it what's that titanium it's got a funny name oh, the, uh, uh not too kinky yeah. yeah that stuff tends to be the best that yeah i've found in terms of longevity yeah for those rear hooks yeah. <laughs> probably not the easiest to work with no it's weird but once once you do, and I've, we can go through that once I have the eyes sure. on, yeah. I've actually found there's a few things you can do when you're making those that just make it easier. Yep. Um, but, yeah, so the last part of this um, is the head, and I like to use uh, five-minute epoxy. It does take a little while longer, and you can totally use UV stuff and all of that. I haven't used that as much. Um, I've just always use this um it sinks i like that i like that on the head it, it does have that weight element to it um and they've just it's just lasted really well i've not really had not really ever had issues um with it falling apart or anything where did my eyes go, there we go. and then for the eyes um these are the half inch eyes um, I think on the example one that I had, these are some orange flies. I think I got these from Finland <laughs> back in the day. Um, so let me get these pulled out. And then I know you can use you can you can use this tool for this. This might seem kind of weird. I like to cut off matches. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically the same thing, but I just kind of got into the role of doing this um, because I think one time tying, I couldn't find this. And I was like, oh, shoot, like I've got the epoxy poured out. What am I going to do? And so, I've, of course, I have like a box of matches in my desk drawer and pulled one of those out, cut off the tip. And I actually found that I really like the angle on it because – the way I'll glue the eyes, once I'm putting the glue in, I'll actually use that sharp, flat edge to pack the epoxy behind. And even if it's already behind there, I'll sometimes use it depending on how they apply, just to kind of neaten everything up. And then I'll also, I like the flat edge of the match 
because sometimes the glue will start to come over the sides of the eyes. I like using the flat edge of the, the match just to kind of scrape it off. And I've and then at the end I can just throw it out and I don't have to clean it or anything. Um, but yeah, so that's that's a good tip. Little little different. Um, It'll save you from scraping your bod can clean every time too. Yeah. Which. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I usually keep a utility blade on my desk just to scrape mm-hmm. remaining epoxy off and <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. <laughs> but So yeah, I got I get And we carry at the shop we do carry a, a two part epoxy. It's called Z Epoxy. Um it's it, just like Tommy said, it's super durable stuff. It's really, really easy to use in that five minute time frame it seems like a long time but honestly you're not going to worry about drips after a minute or so really once you get your eyes set in there it's just the right amount of time to to start applying things yeah so i'll put about that much on so equal parts and then i'll show this in a second but what i like to do is whatever color i've been working with i will take this end and then just trim some of it into the epoxy and it just kind of adds it continues on with that color throughout the whole fly and carries it on into the head so there's more more flash which i know maybe a little more time investment into the fly but again these things last so long um might as well so it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a super big amount it'll just kind of trim in like that um, and then get mixing it. I'm sure you could go buy some glitter if you want. Yes, to. you could it's... totally do glitter, but <laughs> if you, if you are tying these, you, you might get made fun an... of a little bit with the glitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. You'll, if you, if you're tying these, you will have flash left over to an extent. Um, so just make sure to stir it up really well. It'll kind of get cloudy at first, and you'll kind of know that it's ready to go on once it starts to get clearer again. Um, but I like to make sure that it's really stirred in. All right, so now that stirred and I'm just going to go on and I know sometimes you can put that on first. I like to go ahead and put on the eyes in the beginning and the way I do this, I just you'll see it better on the front. I like it to overlap the thread just slightly. And these will kind of be moving these around a little bit. I don't I don't know if the camera can pick that up. But we'll kind of adjust these as the glue is drying. But you want it to be over the flash, completely covering the thread, and then just hanging over, I don't know, that's maybe a eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch, something like that. Um, and then we'll just get a big you know, epoxy here. And then I just drop it right on the top. And this definitely takes a little bit of patience, but this is where I like having that flat um, flat end with the match. And as it's kind of sinking in, I'll just kind of slowly push it back um, into the gap to fill it in. And then we'll just keep rotating the vise around so it doesn't drip because otherwise it'll kind of set weird. Um, As you can see, it's already kind of a quick come back to this. So let that drip subside again. And then flip it back around and keep going. That's pretty, pretty good, I think. And then I'll kind of like wiggle the eyes a little bit back and forth. Um, and I often look at it from 
head on. So again, we determined that this was the top of the fly um, and I'll kind of look down the middle of it and just kind of keep, keep pinching. Um, sometimes you can just clamp it if you want. Um, if you don't want to keep going, I'm gonna put just a little bit more in here. Why Tommy's working on that, we did get a question about mm -hmm. um, some differences in epoxy, uh, five minute versus some other just standard epoxy out there. And, you know, this is this is from my viewpoint where I order this stuff for the shop. You really want to be looking at the five minute versus regular. You, the first thing you need to look at is working time and how much time you have to manipulate it before it starts to set mm -hmm. the second thing is how it dries does it dry clear does it dry white does it stay clear if it's if it because there are there's plenty of epoxies out there that'll actually yellow over time with uv exposure i've seen that mm -hmm. it's it's it stinks when your whole fly collection starts to <laughs> oh everything's yellow now that's kind of disappointing but um uh, so things to look at. Um, I know guys that, that do the UV thing as well. If you're going to do that, some quick tips. Do not use UV to adhere your eyes. Use it to fill in the gaps. And that's, you know, I, I've seen people do that. But the problem is most of these eyes have a paper backer and that UV light is not going to penetrate to, you know, harden that and cure that glue. So like a gel super glue and then something like loon thick uh, UV or, you know, whoever else is making a thicker epoxy out there to fill those gaps between the eyes. It can work a lot faster, but Tommy's right that this is, it's just, it's just proven, you know, there's no finicky, you know, did I cure it right? Did I put enough in there? And it balances the fly really well with the hook. I mean, is that, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like I like using the stuff, having that little extra weight on the front of the fly, um, especially when you have like the wiggle tail and everything hanging off the back. And if you don't have any of that and just have a hook rig in it, then it just it's it's a nice a nice balance for the fly. Anyways, another thing I want to say that I, I again I like about using matches <laughs> is as it's drying, sometimes the glue will run down onto the tube. I like holding a match like this and then just spinning it and it'll create a nice clean edge on the glue That's as smart. it's drying. Okay. As it's drying. Do you do anything special while it's drying? Do you, I mean, are you rotating it? Do you have I'm, a, a I'm special pinwheel kind of, thing at home or? No, I'll just kind of keep an eye on it. I'll keep, I'll typically, as it gets drier and drier, I'll keep kind of pushing on the eyes because I want that head to form nice and not like hollow out too much. Sure. Um, and again, I'll keep an eye like like just now there's a little bit more drip on, on the back inside, so I'll kind of rotate it like that and just kind of keep an eye on it. Um, Do you usually get away with one application of epoxy? Yeah. Yep. I think that just it just takes time. You could do an initial set, probably put a hair clip to keep your eyes in place, mm -hmm. and then come back and do it again later if you want. But Yeah, I've, I've only ever done one. And then now... Now that it's getting closer to being dry, which you can tell if you go back to this, and once that starts going, then obviously this is as well, I will take off this, the clips. Oops, that's static. Just turn that off. Um, and then hold it upright. And then what I wanna do is pull this up just a little bit so that it's Pull the not shoulders super up. packed down. And what that's doing is pulling it into the epoxy so it'll always stay up like that. So the epoxy isn't isn't crushing it at all. And then again, just kind of check the front here. That's pretty much it. And then once once that's a little bit more dry, and then we'll trim trim some of this. And then I, I just use a once I've taken it off, I'll um, taking it off the mandrel, I'll just hold it on the edge of the table and kind of do a clean slice through right on the front. Oops. 
<laughs> this flash is like it happens with that thinner static. flash it tends to curl up more i find than the say the magnum or the salt water or anything like that this one especially has got some like static electricity going on in it it's Almost Why there. while Tommy's playing with that and this is uh we're drying our final steps, we're we're approaching a new record of a of a two hour fly here at the Northern Angler, which is <laughs> but these aren't th quick. <laughs> they're not quick, uh, but that's thanks to all the awesome questions we've gotten. I'll just ask uh Tommy real quick, uh you know I was gonna say, you know, what the what the best way to get in touch with you with questions, but uh probably the best is pro what would you say instagram probably instagram yeah how do they find you on instagram Tommy? um it's just type dot random at type dot random <laughs> at type yep. dot random and he's again <laughs> you can find him he's tagged in uh today's post on our page as well so that's an easy way to find him real quick um and i know he's happy to to answer questions in the future and you can just leave comments down below as well um next week we have russ madden if you don't know russ you will oh, after sure. next week. Uh, <laughs> he's his mind has been behind some of the the biggest developments and breakthroughs in in trout angling and tying and the and the whole streamer movement that was developed in northern Michigan. Uh, always excited to see what he's come up with. I just talked to him yesterday about some new brushes he's working with that he's going to feature from Our Designs, which is part of Renzetti, and. Uh, We've got some cool ones after that. We're going to do a game changer with Ed McCoy. Uh, I'm really excited to see that. And then we're doing, like I mentioned, steelhead tubes. So think about if you have not done so, hit that subscribe button down below. Maybe the notification bell uh, so you know when we have new videos out. And you know, if you haven't done so, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, all the normal social media stuff. But uh we would love to see if you're tying these, whether it's on tubes, on hooks. Mm -hmm. We'd love to see these pictures. I know Tommy would um, <laughs> as well. And you can tag us on Instagram or send them to our email. At, we're just at flyshop at the northern, northern Um And then uh, I think Tommy's going to run through just a rig real quick. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we'll probably sign off for the evening. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out. We still We're still going strong, so... Yeah, so for kind of I showed you earlier um, the basic hook rigging. Let me pull up this other one that I have. Glad we gave you a full table to work with. <laughs> yeah, this thing. We tied one fly and that table is just covered and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so really this is let me move. This is the basic hook rig system that I'm I'm doing, and I'll I'll show you the the materials that I'm using to make this in a second. But I really like six aught hook. Um, I'll tie a rattle to that, which is great not only for sound but weight for helping it uh, sink, if especially if you're you're jigging it. Um, big trailer hook and then I'll, I'll put a fast attach clip on the back and that's what I will also put on a wiggle tail and then again this is totally optional you don't have to fish one of these on on this system but if you want to um, it's very easy to put on and off different colors different sizes um, I, I, I think they give the best action um, yeah, then the knot that I'm using is just a melted, twisted loop. So you're literally putting this hook in a vise, and then this is 40-pound uh, Rio bite wire. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I'm just I'm slowly twisting it, melting it with a lighter. You can't over-melt it. If it turns black, it's shot. You just want it to start bubbling a little bit. Um, and then I'm using, this is actually Rio's, I think it's their spin. Bay, something shrink tube. It's, I just want it's to... probably their it's probably their welding tubing. Yes, yeah, is yeah. what that is. I bought a big bag of it a long time ago, and then pull all of them out, so I forgot the name of it, and I just which it, is smart because this... it is very difficult to find that small a uh, shrink tube. Yeah, it, I mean... that was something. I mean, we were I was going to not only Ace like all these different hardware stores, electrical stores, trying to find random sizes of yep. shrink tube, and it's harder than you think. Um, anyways, and then I run. 
this is about maybe about two feet um, total. And then I will, it's just all loop to loop. So, which makes it really easy to rig. Cause then once you've run it through the fly, you put the bead and the um, cone head on it. And then you just loop to loop um, it too. I use 50 pound fluorocarbon. Um, and then if I'm fishing a sink line, I'll fish maybe three feet long leader something like that yeah and then if i'm fishing more of an intermediate line that'll maybe be for a little over four feet not sure. too, super long i mean it's yeah yeah so i usually is, recommend people if, if they're buying a lot of the commercial leaders like the rio leaders we carry which are awesome if you're running a, a hook because they come already uh cinched down ready to go with a uh, twist clip they call it and but the problem is usually that that mono or floral whatever they're using depending on the one is a little too long it's almost eight feet total leader mm. which is if you're using a sink tip it's long i yeah. usually recommend people cut them down yeah 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 that is quite um but yeah so i use i have one what is it here I have one attached to this. This is actually, if I wasn't fishing a um, tube fly and was fishing like a jointed fly, or if you had tied this on a hook, um, here's one of the leader setups. So I've got my fluoro here. Um, again, all loop to loop. I'll just loop it um, directly to the, the line. And then what I've done is um, I've just taken a regular titanium leader. These are terminator leaders which I've really liked for pike fishing. I've only bought in a handful of them and they last a really long time. Um, but I really, what I really like about them is their clips. They don't come undone. I've never lost anything popping off, which when you have this big of a fly, you know, flapping around in sure. the wind, it can happen. Oh yeah. Um, and I basically just, all I did was cut off the swivel and they already had a loop that had padding on it and everything. And I just looped to loop that directly. And the connection, as you can see, I mean, it, it stays really nice in yeah. line. Um, but yeah, so this is, I'm using this fluorocarbon. Um, and then as Matt said earlier, the not too kinky, I like the 55 pound, at least if you go lighter than that, um, the hook rigs, you do, what you don't want is this to start drooping a lot. So I like going with 55 and it sticks out maybe two inches off the back of the hook. That's roughly, I mean, you can go a little bit longer sure. if you want, but if you're putting the wiggle tails and all of that, um, that's, that's about the length, um, that I like to go. And when you're tying this on the hook rig, what I found is really easy is once you've determined the length that the not too kinky part is going to be, and you cut it, if you kind of fold it over so if, if these are the two ends you fold it over grab them so they're the exact same length put a single bead on mm -hmm. if you're putting a fast attach that goes on first and then put a bead on and then while holding them the same slide the bead all the way to the end and it'll almost like click into place yep and then you're not dealing with it otherwise it'll be flying all over the place it's really hard to tie in it's just super obnoxious um but that works really well um to get this set and then it, it gives you a nice straight um, piece to tie on the hook. Um, let's see, what else? Oh yeah, oh, I guess this was. Oh yeah, I guess there I do you have this. In touch level T, I, this is. No, that's, I guarantee that's a sink tip and you just reuse the packaging, I'm sorry. Uh, this level T would be T material, oh. right? Does it say like T? No, it's, it's level T welding tubing. Oh, oh there you go. Level I, like T I said, tubing. This was okay. kind of a weird. Right. I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. The barcode on it is super faded. It's it's super old. <laughs> um, and then wiggle towels. This is oh, just a bunch. Man. These are a bunch of wiggle towels that I keep um, with me on the boat. Um, all different shapes, sizes. I mean, they the stuff they just came out with not that long ago is super cool yeah um there's paddle tails and dragon tails and it's awesome it's really you can cool. i've like drawn on them with permanent markers so they're lined i mean you have the jumbo ones we um, used to order these from europe and yes <laughs> we'd like split a pack yes <laughs> and order a lot of them yeah um this is the dragon tail which is super cool it's just lots of action i mean they make arini i believe is the guy's name yeah, uh, yeah. Pablo. I'm not going to spell that. 
<laughs> I will uh I will amend our materials list for this too. It will include some some mono and all the stuff for the rigging for this and I'll probably even link the video to Bauer tying this yeah. rig because yeah. it's, it's it's really valuable to have. It's super valuable. And he I think that one is in English. I believe it is. I believe it is. I if can't it, remember what year they switched from just Swedish with no subtitles to to in English yeah. or with subtitles, but you, you either way, either way, either it's way. it's really really good information on any of this. Um Cool. Any last questions from anyone out there? We're getting a ton of a ton of people chiming in saying this is fascinating and great job tying this. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I'm super appreciative to have Tommy here and pick his brain. Uh, he's been doing this longer than I have with the big pike stuff, so it's uh, that's the the benefit of having friends at the fly shop. So, <laughs> um, cool. I think uh, anything else you got, Tommy? Uh, I guess we'll uh not really. I mean that's pretty much it. This is we're gonna break it out of the all, vice here. This is all set up now, so you're left with this. I mean this is about I'm probably not gonna trim that at all. Um and then I'll really just pull this back and then on the edge, what am I? Man, we I buried a, everything. A, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 worse at home yeah and then this i'll just take a blade and then i just i'll leave a little bit extra just so the eyes are a little bit protected um and then i'll just slice that forward and that is pretty much it um and then yeah this is a little bit long here so to trim that <laughs> find your scissors first um I'll, I'll kind of go like this. Sorry, Matt, I'm going to make a mess here. I'm um, not concerned. And I'll kind of hold it down so it's all together. And then kind of going at an angle, I'll just kind of slowly close the scissors as I'm going down. There's a few long ones. Oops, there you go. There we go. And I'll just kind of run down like that. And I might trim this down even a little bit more once I put a, a hook rig. You want the flash, if you are fishing wiggle tails, you want the flash just to hang over the the first part of the wiggle tail just a little bit um not too much because you don't want to hinder the action of it um so like if i wasn't going to fish a wiggle tail i'd probably stop around in this area but i most likely will fish one so i'm going to take off just a little bit more and there's again there's no rush in this um yeah we'll kind of go with it about like that for now and then we can see for sure using the rig that we just went over. It's again, once everything's tied, it's super easy. It's a lot of setup time, but once it's all done, it's really easy. And on pike weather, to me, the best pike weather is just gross days when it's choppy and yeah. spitting rain and just kind of nasty. And it's nice not having to tie all the knots, do all the things. You have everything rigged, and it's just either like clicking into place or all loop to loop. Yep. And that's, that's I hate it. tying wire anyways. It's just, <laughs> it never so yeah, ends well. So that's that is what it looks like. And again, with with the hook being the larger um, eye, it just sits right in. It's nice and stable, um, and just kind of you know situate it how you want it. The hook is just coming out just before the end of the of that and this could probably be trimmed just a tiny bit more around there um but that's that's just about where you would where you would that's want. smart to put the put the rig together and see how it looks before yeah before fully because the last thing you want to do is trim it too short and then it's right yeah but so yeah that's Pretty much, it could probably still go a little bit more, but yeah. That's the format. Boom. That is the format. And then that is ready to fish. And just like this, it'll be a lot lighter. And if you're fishing slow or an intermediate line, this will fish great as is. Um, but if you want to go deeper, I'll put a bead on, not only to protect um, the head of the fly from a cone slapping the eyes, um, but also that there's another additional clicking noise from sure. the cone head hitting the bead. Um, 
and even if I'm fishing slower, I tend to put that on anyways, just because I like that jigging motion. I, I like that it has almost that like wounded, sure. wounded appearance oh, as yeah. you're as you're retrieving it. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Cool. That's gonna do it for this week's edition. This was I I don't even know what episode it probably will say here <laughs> at the end, but uh, this has been fun so far, and we still have another two months of live fly time. We're going all the way through March, and we're going to bring in some special guests I've been uh, communicating with over the, the Instagram and the phone, so I'm excited for that. Um, stay tuned. I'll announce more guests as we move forward, but thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in, and a big thanks to Tommy. Uh, we will see you all next week, everyone. Stay healthy. Stay well. We'll see you soon. Thank you.